Steve, whatever you just did worked. Kind of. like those are getting passed out. Steve, do you want to throw up the slides for today? There we go. Great. You guys are super eager today. We had three minutes. I wasn't ready. No, it's okay. All good. All good. Let me give a super quick recap where we've been and then we'll pray and we'll jump in today. Um, we have been in the epistles, right? So we're reading the epistles, mostly those of Paul. If you remember, we talked about when you're reading epistles, it's primarily showing us what Paul understood was necessary to be a Christian in the Roman Empire, right? So you have these new believers who are trying to wrestle with becoming a Christian following Jesus, but they're in the Roman Empire, which is telling them to do everything other than that. So a lot of these um, letters really simply is just, how do I live out my faith in a culture that doesn't want me to live out my faith? Obviously, still applicable to all of us all over the world today. Um, so we've been going through the letters. We were in, I'm trying to remember where we left off. I think we did 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, and Philippians last week, and as you see, we're going to attempt, I'm not promising I'll get through all these today, but we're going to attempt to do Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, and 1st and 2nd Timothy today. But before we do that, let me say a prayer, and then we'll jump in. Lord God, we just thank you for your word. I'm just daily and weekly reminded of the blessing it is that we have your written word, the words from your very mouth through um, these prophets, through these apostles, um, through your people, that we don't have to speculate what you think, we don't have to speculate what you call us to do, we don't have to speculate what you are doing or have done in this world, but we know it through your word. And we're just thankful that we have that. We're thankful that we have individual copies that we can study Um, at our leisure, and we just pray that you would continue to help us to see the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. May it open our minds to understanding better the wisdom that comes forth out of your word. May it transform our hearts so that our hearts of stone will continually be turned into hearts of flesh that love people as as we should, that love you as we should. And may it motivate our hands and feet so that we are actually salt and light in this world that we are actually going out and doing what your word says. So Lord, thank you for this word. Be with us as we study it again this morning. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So we are going to be, like I said, we're going to start in Colossians. So again, if we're looking at our timeline, we're going to be jumping a little bit today. So we're going to start in Colossians, um, early 60s. 
Then we're going to jump back to First and Second Thessalonians, which with Galatians is arguably one of the oldest epistles of Paul. And then if we get to it and we have time, we'll jump to First and Second Timothy, which are some of the newest or some of the latest um, letters of Paul. So there's a timeline again. If we look at a map to see where Colossae is, you have to actually zoom in quite a bit. So that's what that's trying to show us. Um, then we'll look at Thessalonica, which is up in northern Greece. Uh, and then we're going to go back to Ephesus because that's where Timothy is pastoring when Paul writes to him in First and Second Timothy. So, for reference, that is where we will be in the world. Let's jump into Colossians. Colossians, okay. Book of Colossians can be summed up as a letter encouraging relatively new believers to continue to trust in the faith of Christ that they have received, warning them against outside religious influences. It's written by Paul, but Timothy's with him, to this small church in Colossae and probably also to the church in Laodicea. And he writes it from his imprisonment in Rome. We'll see a lot of these letters come during that time. And it's written around AD 60 to 61. Now, quick overview of the little town, little city of Colossae. It's a hillside city that actually in the early 60s was destroyed by, a, by an earthquake. So that's why we know very little about it. And it's most likely why when we get to the book of Revelation and the Apostle John is writing to the churches in, in Turkey, at the, in Asia Minor at that point, that Colossae isn't part of it is most likely because by then it had been destroyed and they decided not to rebuild it. It was too kind of tenuous of a, of a place to keep rebuilding a city, so they just kind of abandoned and moved elsewhere. So in many ways, this letter is like the preservation of this community because not a year or two after they received this letter, their city is destroyed. Um, we don't know exactly how the church in Colossae got started, but it most likely happened through the conversion and ministry of Epaphras and Philemon during Paul's three-year stay in Ephesus. So while he was doing ministry in Ephesus, he's preaching the gospel, and Epaphras and Philemon probably come to faith there, start to understand what it means to be a disciple. They go back to their hometown of Colossae and start a church, start kind of doing ministry there. So it, it wasn't um, planted by Paul, per se, but it was planted through the disciples of Paul in many ways. So it's really interesting kind of look at second-generation believers here. It's not Paul starting a church, but his, his own disciples um, starting this church. Now, he's writing this letter because he's sitting in, in prison in Rome again, and he receives this word from Epaphras. He's come from Colossae. He's come to Paul uh, in Rome. And he's saying, hey, I just wanted to tell you about what's going on in these churches over here. And he receives mostly a good report. Things are going relatively well. You don't have to worry. But there's a couple things that he wants to address. So he writes this letter back, and it's mostly encouraging them to continue in their faithfulness. So again, these are newer believers. They have a couple questions. But he's really just encouraging them, like, I'm just, I'm so thankful for your faith and that um, it's going well. And so he's mostly encouraging, but he gives a little bit, um, a little bit more information about addressing some errors that they were being attracted to. Specifically, in the book of Colossians, the biggest thing that's happening is syncretism, which is when you take your faith and you try to bring pieces of culture into it, or pieces of another religion. So it would be like they were constantly dealing with how do you be a Christian but also go get circumcised or deal with the food laws or how do I be a Christian but also continue to worship at the temple or be a part of some of the Greek uh, mythology and stuff. So they were dealing a lot with this syncretism and as a result the book of Colossians and you'll see this and if you read it you've probably been struck by it. Paul's point is Christ is all sufficient and Christ is all supreme. That's like pretty much the two-word the two word summation of the book of Colossians. Christ is all-sufficient. You don't need anything else from anywhere else. And he's all-supreme. He's better than everything else. 
So he's, he's writing to, these, to this church. It has Jews, it has Gentiles, it has native um, Phrygians who live there. Um, and he just wants to show them that these other cultural ideas, these other religious ideas are a threat to the gospel. And you'll see as you read it, he talks about circumcision, he talks about food laws, about festivals, he talks about angel worship, about mysticism. So it's, it's both Jewish and Greek kind of philosophies here. And he's just stressing again, Christ is supreme and Christ is sufficient. You don't need anything else. Sorry, I'm like not with it. There we go. Um, so he's writing again, mostly to encourage them in their faithfulness, but also to address some of these errors. So when it comes to themes, again, all supremacy, all sufficiency of Christ. Christ both forgives sins and removes one from the terror of the powers. That's mostly spiritual powers. Um, Again, religious rules and regulations count for nothing, but ethical life that bears God's own image counts for everything. This is when you get to Colossians, I think it's roughly Colossians 3, he talks about being dead to sin and alive in Christ. That's where he's going here, is that the law isn't sufficient for making you alive. It's only sufficient for showing you how dead you are, but the Spirit is the thing that actually can bring you new life in Christ. And then finally, Christ-like living affects relationships of all kinds. He talks about families. He talks about work relationships, worship relationships. Um, This letter flows fairly seamlessly, beginning with this glowing Thanksgiving encouragement, uh, encouraging prayer report, as well as a reiteration of the truth of the gospel that they had received. So it starts off really positive. But then interspersed in all that, are some of these errors, and not just the errors, but the follies of, of following these errors. Um, just again, showing the gospel is greater, Jesus is greater than all of these things. And then he turns again towards the end of the book to how Christian behavior truly stems from having died and been raised with Christ, and now being hidden with Christ in God, right? That's in Colossians 3 there. Um, and thus it expresses itself in the image of the Creator. So he's kind of, the, the, the path he's taking is, Here's the gospel you heard. I'm so thankful that you're continuing to walk in it. That's really encouraging. Remember the gospel and don't give in to the follies of following these errors because when you truly believe and live the gospel, you'll, ha- you'll die to Christ and you'll die in Christ. Your sinful ways will be, be destroyed. All the desires to want to go follow these other ideologies will be destroyed and you'll find new life in Christ which will make you truly alive and which will affect all these relationships as you live out more and more into the image of the creator that you were created in. So, in many ways, Paul is trying to show the externals of, cre- of Christian living stem from the realities um, of who God is and who we are in God. So, I'll pop out for a second and give you my pastoral advice. I think this is helpful for us when we give in to, okay, I'm a Christian, and God wants me and needs me to do X, Y, or Z, and we feel this, we almost put legalism back on top of us. What Paul is trying to show us here is that, yes, it is important to obey God. It's important to live into those new realities, but they stem from who God is and who we are in God, not from this sense of obligation that God will not be happy with us, God will not accept us if we don't do X, Y, or Z. It's more of a living out of the thanksgiving of your new life in Christ. So as you die with Christ, you raise to new life in him, what other way could we possibly live other than to live as God wants us to, as we're thankful, as we are excited and encouraged by what God has done for us? So it's this, this is who, what the gospel is, this is who God is, and now this is who we are as a result. Just really briefly, when it comes to reading the book of Colossians, four helps that I kind of have up here is again, look out for what Paul is saying against these errors. He's specifically addressing syncretism, so not giving in to other ideologies and putting them into the gospel. Again, I think that's a human tendency. We have God's sufficient word in front of us, and we say, but what if we just add this to it? What if we just make this kind of spin on it and it'll make it, make it feel a little bit more comfortable or this or that? And Paul in the book of Colossians is reminding us what we have in Christ is, is enough. It's all sufficient. Christ is better than all these other worldly systems, so follow him fully. Um, Again, he's trying to stress his absolute supremacy over all things. And then again, remember the situation of the church. Paul doesn't actually know this church. 
You know, most of the other letters we read, it's these really personal appeals of, of his friends who he loves, who he's done ministry with. Paul doesn't know the churches here. He just knows who their pastor is, really. And as he comes and kind of comes back to Paul and says, this is what's going on, Paul says, well, I want to write them to encourage them. Um, and I'll have to do that kind of from, from, a, 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 from an, a, an area of not really knowing who they are. So as opposed to some of the letters, like the letter of Ephesians, where it's very personal, First, Second Corinthians, very personal, here it's kind of like zoomed out big picture. So like, let me just talk broadly about the gospel. Let me just talk broadly about Christian living. Whereas First and Second Corinthians, it's like, let me talk about very specifics, about singleness, about sexual morality. Let's talk about idolatry. Let's talk about Jewish regulations. Because he knows that, you know, John Smith in the first row of the, in the, the church in Corinth deals with those things or has asked questions about those things. Here in the book of Colossians, he's really just addressing big general ideas. And then finally, and we'll get to this when we uh, eventually get to the book of Philemon, uh, Onesimus, how do I say this without spoiling? Well, it doesn't matter. We're going to get there anyway. But the book of Philemon is all about Philemon's slave, Onesimus, has run away, come found Paul, has been converted and now believed in Jesus, and Paul is writing to Philemon to receive him back well. You know, receive him back as a brother. Don't reprimand him. Don't scold him. And this is all happening at this church in Colossae. So as he's writing this letter and sending it back, he's also preparing the church to receive Onesimus back and, and preparing Philemon to receive Onesimus back as well. So you see some of that flavoring in the book too as he's trying to show this is the new realities of who we are in Christ. It, we're all one. We're all brothers and sisters in one faith. We're no longer seen by our, you know, who we are, what our occupations are, um, or any other type of socioeconomic identifier, we are all one in the gospel. So that's kind of in the back of Paul's mind as well. All right, fire host Colossians overview. Any questions on the book of Colossians? Again, one of the greatest passages out of Colossians is, I think it's Colossians 1, 15, where he's talking about just who Jesus is and how he has created all things. And again, just that all supremacy of who Christ is um, in the universe, that he wasn't just a prophet, he wasn't just a teacher. He really is God who came in flesh. Okay. Remember in our timeline, we're going to jump back now about 10, 12 years in Paul's life, and we're going to go to First and Second Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians, roughly a, thank, a letter of thanksgiving, encouragement, exhortation. So he's thanking, he's thankful for them, he's encouraging them, he's also strongly urging them um, in their faith, and he's giving information for very recent Gentile believers. And, and we're going to get to how recent. I mean, we're talking months recent. So this is like brand new believers that he's addressing here in this letter. Written uh, by Paul with Silas, kind of with Timothy, I'll explain why I say that in a second, but he's writing to these new converts in Thessalonica. He's writing from Corinth, and it's roughly around 50 or 51. So Thessalonica was this free city. It's the capital of Macedonia, which is in northern Greece. Um, it, it also is on the Ignatian Way, which we talked a week or two ago, is this really prominent trade route. So it has become this affluent city. It's become very prosperous. It's also very diverse. Um, and it has, it, how this letter comes about is really interesting. And, and to understand it, you have to jump into the situation in Acts 17, specifically in the first nine verses. So if you were to jump back there, you'd see that Paul and Silas had just been to Thessalonica, and they had this great success. They were there, and people were just coming in droves to hear the gospel. The church was growing. It was just this really great time of encouragement. But then within a couple weeks of being there, it also caused this great opposition. So as the whole city is kind of being turned upside down, all the leaders in the city are like, this isn't good. we got to get this guy out of here. So they had been staying. So uh, Paul, Timothy, and Silas had been staying with Jason the Tanner. If you remember, as you're reading Acts, it talks about Jason the Tanner. They're staying with him, and the uh, officials actually come 
and they arrest Jason, and they charge him with high treason. So they're looking around going, uh-oh, our host has just been, you know, accused of high treason on the Roman Empire. That's not going to end well for him. And so as they're having this great success, all of Paul's friends kind of come in the middle of the night, and they're like, we got to get you out of here. This isn't a good spot for you to stay in anymore. There's no way that you're going to escape this. So they kind of usher the three of them out of the city over the, you know, in the veil of night, and they get a little bit of the ways down the road after Acts 17, 1 through 9. We get to Paul in Athens. It, if you remember when he's talking at the Areopagus, which is one of my favorite passages, it says that he, at the beginning of the passage, that he's waiting for his friends. Well, it's because they kind of just like booked it out of Thessalonica and didn't know what to do when we're trying to wait for each other. So he's through Athens. He actually goes to Berea, and then he finds his way to Corinth. And what happens is he, as he gets kind of shooed out of Thessalonica, he is intensely worried about these new believers that he didn't really have the time to, to keep discipling. He was only there for a few weeks, maybe a month, and all of a sudden he's shooed out, and he's just, the whole time he's in Athens, the whole time he's in Berea, he's just going, what happened to that church? I really hope they're doing well. And he desperately wants to go back. Um, but his friends convince him that that would be too dangerous, right? He would be immediately recognized and probably arrested and probably killed. So he decides to send Timothy back. So this is where I, I, a lot of overview for that final point there. He sends Timothy back and he says, why don't you go check on them for me? So he sends Timothy. Timothy now returns to him. He's in Corinth. He and Silas are in Corinth. Returns to him and says, they're actually doing really well. Things are going really well. The Lord has been gracious to them. Um, but they, they also have asked several questions because they're new in their faith and they were still trying to wrestle with what's going on. So Paul is writing them back to kind of encourage them and, again, um, a, a letter of thanksgiving to them. I'm so thankful that things are going so well for you, but also let me address some of these areas where you're weak. Um, and, and honestly, when we get to the themes here, you see some of the areas where they're weak. So again, he's showing his loving concern for his friends here. They're trying to struggle with, well, you came in, and we, our lives are changed by this gospel, but all of a sudden, everyone's now being arrested and persecuted. Well, you know, what's that about? Is that normal? Is that what the Christian life's supposed to be? So he writes, yes, it is, right? Jesus showed us that part of the Christian life is enduring suffering. Again, they're, they're new to their faith, so they need... Um, reminders of what does holiness look like. One of the big issues that he's dealing with, and it actually comes back in Second Thessalonians as well, is that there's a contingency of people in this, in this church that are kind of just mooching off of others. They're not working. They're just saying, well, I'll just keep kind of being lazy, and I'll just let so-and-so kind of take care of me. So he writes to them to say, you know, it's not, that's not a way to live. That's not a good way to live is just to try to live off the generosity of others. You really should work um, for a living. And he uses himself as an example, right? I could have come. I could have asked for money from you. I could have, I could have done all these things. But instead, um, I'm working. I'm a tent maker. I'm actually doing work here in order to make money to do ministry among you. And then as you read First and Second Thessalonians, a lot of people flock to these books because Paul talks a lot about the end times and the second coming. And so, so here he's writing to this church that, you know, he's given them the gospel and then he got shooed away. And they're going, wait, you said something about the resurrection. We need more because we don't quite understand what's going on um, about that. And so one of the passages that you'll read in these letters is about what, what happened to those who have just died? Where do they go? We, we know the resurrection's coming, but, you know, my, my neighbor just died. And wh where are they right now? So he talks a lot about um, don't be fearful for them. They're, they, you know, they're going to be with God as well. And so um, addresses a lot of issues about the end times and the second coming. So when you're reading this letter, um, you'll notice in, in chapter 2, all of a sudden he starts defending himself. It's important to know that the, the um, charges that he's defending himself against are the same that you would have found in any type of other pagan philosophical writing. And, and all I mean by that is that these are the charges leveled against religious charlatans. So he's pretty much saying, you've heard it about me that I am this, this, and this. And, he's, and he, they would know that because that would be the charges that in any other writing they would read would be the same charges against anyone who's just um, kind of making up a religion, just there to steal people's money. 
and he's saying, let me show you how I'm not those things. So just something to keep in mind as you're reading it. Another important thing is that, and you guys probably know this, you've read enough history, you've seen enough books or movies, that Greeks and Romans did not see sexual pr promiscuity as a problem. They didn't see it as immoral. It was an accepted way of life. So, I mean, a lot of Paul's letters are addressing these, and it's not just because the gospel changes how we view love and sex and marriage and all that, but because the culture that they were in really didn't cherish that stuff, really didn't hold that to high esteem, and didn't even see it as a problem. So he's addressing these things, one, to say this is how it should affect you, this is how the gospel should have changed your life in that way, but also because the world around you, the culture around you, is going to say that what I'm telling you is way wrong, and that this isn't a big deal, and that you should go and do whatever you want in this area. And he's trying to say that's not how it's going to be. Um, third, that there is actually a lot of archaeological evidence that the churches here, um, or even the, the pagans here in Thessalonica were intensely interested in matters of life after death. So they found pottery and different uh, manuscripts and all this stuff that shows that they really were interested in what's going to happen to us after we die, which also shows, one, why they have such grave misunderstandings about it, and two, why Paul feels obligated to make sure they know what that looks like as a believer in Jesus Christ. What has Christ done through the cross, through his resurrection, in order to bring us eternal life after death? And then finally, um, just a side note, it might be helpful to read this alongside of the book of Philippians just because they're in very similar contexts. They're both in very prosperous and diverse areas that were trade routes. They are both dealing with a lot of external cultural pressure. They are all dealing with intense suffering for their faith and wrestling through how do I find joy and peace in the midst of suffering. Um, so, when you read these together, you see a lot of the similar threads. Although it's different contexts and different churches, we see a lot of similar threads. All right, questions on First Thessalonians. So, this is, these letters are, are some of the earliest because, I mean, we're talking in the middle of Acts 17. Paul starts this church goes away, and then immediately is like, I need to write to them. I need to make sure they're doing okay. So he writes First Thessalonians. And then not just, it's only a couple months later that he actually writes the letter of Second Thessalonians. So we're still in roughly, as it says up there, we're still in roughly AD 51. He's still with uh, Silas and Timothy. And this one is primarily, again, it's a letter of further encouragement because now they're facing even more suffering. And it's a warning against being misled um, regarding the coming of the Lord. Again, they're still struggling with that concept. And what had happened, in, and I'll talk about this in a second, what had happened is someone had supposedly said, well, Paul actually said that the day of the Lord has already happened. So if that's the case, we're living in these end times and all this stuff kind of unravels. And Paul's saying, hold on, you've heard it from my mouth. You've seen it in my letter. That's not what I'm saying at all. And he feels the need to address that again. And then he further is talking about some of these uh, who were living in the city there who were just mooching off others who weren't working for a living. So when you get to this letter, if you, especially if you're reading them, say you're in a Bible plan and you just finished First Thessalonians, you say, I'm just going to read Second Thessalonians while I'm at it. You'll notice that the warm affection from First Thessalonians is not there as much in Second Thessalonians because he's addressing a lot of the same issues. And think about it if you, you know, are talking to your kids and you say, hey, stop hitting your little brother. And then five minutes later, turns around and hits the little brother and you're going, hey, I said stop hitting your little brother, right? You, the, the warm grace that you had in the first uh, kind of exhortation has now somewhat disappeared in the second one. This is what's happening with Paul here is he's saying, stop mooching off others, go work for a living. And then a couple months later goes, did you guys not listen to me? I said stop doing that. And he says, here's everything I need to tell you about the second coming. How in the world are you being misled saying that I've already said that the Lord has come? I just explained it to you not a couple months ago. So a lot of that affection from the first letter has kind of dissipated because he's a little frustrated that they, they're not quite listening to him and quite getting it. So again, he's writing this 
because they've misunderstood the, the timing of Christ's return. He's also heard that these people are not working for their ways yet. Um, so he's trying to write this letter to clear up these misunderstandings and to further reprimand those who are being lazy. So when you get here, you'll see several themes. Um, the first one is the sure salvation of the believers there in Thessalonica versus the sure judgment of their persecutors. Again, he, in order to bring them peace in their suffering, he wants them to understand you have a sure hope in the future that is not contingent on what's going on in your current circumstances. So his point is, yes, you're being persecuted. Yes, you're enduring suffering. But that is not indicative of what your hope will look like. You have a sure foundation. You have a sure hope in Jesus Christ. And then he gives them peace on the other side and saying, and those who are persecuting you also have a sure future. And that's not one of peace. And that's not so again. He's trying to show that what's happening in the world currently around them is not indicative of God's promises of what's going to happen in the future. So they might be pers- being persecuted, and it might look like those who are persecuting are having the good life. And he's saying that might be what's happening right now, but we have a sure hope in which you will be blessed, you will have hope, you will have comfort and peace with God, and they will be judged for their sinfulness and their disobedience. Second is that the day of the Lord is still ahead. It will be preceded by this rebellion. I put it in, in uh, quotes because, and this, you'll see it when I get to the helps for reading this letter, one of the most frustrating things about this letter is he starts talking about the end times, and as believers, we're like, hey, we're kind of interested in what's going to happen in life after death. We're kind of interested in what's going to happen. And he just doesn't give us enough detail to really understand it completely. So we read this letter, and we're like, oh, the rebellion, what is that? And then you're reading and going, he doesn't talk about it. That's frustrating because, again, he's, he's, these are letters written to specific people who already had background that we don't have. So he's probably taught them about this and just said, hey, remember, that has to happen first before Jesus comes back. All right, let's move on. And you're going, oh, I want to know more about that. I wanna. So he talks about this, but we don't get a whole lot of detail. And then finally, again, he's reprimanding these people who weren't working for a living. So again, um, as I said... He expects certain events to take place before the coming of Christ. The specific nature of these events events is less certain. So not only the details, but the timing. And that's really what he wants to show the believers here is stop worrying about when Jesus will come back and start living as if he's coming back tomorrow kind of thing. Um, And the same thing that Jesus was teaching in the Gospels um, is that, yes, there's going to be a rebellion. That might be happening now. That might be happening later. It might be a mix of both. Don't worry about all of that. Just take hope and take heart in the fact that Christ is coming back to bring you into eternal life. And as such, live today as if that's happening tomorrow. Live each day as if today is the last day on earth and that you have um, a responsibility and a duty as a believer to be a witness to the gospel in your everyday life. And then finally, he doesn't go into any detail, and this is more of just a Don't get lost in it again. He's addressing a very specific issue, and sometimes scholars get bored, I think, and they go, I wonder what was happening, why those people weren't working, and they start to speculate about all this, that, and the other thing. The reality is, we don't know, and it doesn't really matter. Paul's point is, don't be lazy, don't just mooch off others, don't just depend on other people's generosity. I mean, I don't know, and you don't need to raise hands how many of you have people like this in your life. I know of many in my own life who are like this, who, you know, they're in the cycle of, I have a job, it's the best job ever. Oh, I'm getting fired because I, you know, because of my personality, because of something I did, and it's everyone else's fault, and it's not mine, and now I'm going to just rely on the generosity of all my friends and family to get by for a while. And that gets really tiring, and that gets really burdensome. And although as believers we're supposed to help those in need and reach out, we know that those people eventually in our lives, they kind of burn out our generosity and they kind of burn out our welcome. And Paul's point is like, yes, we're supposed to be generous, but you're not supposed to depend on everyone's generosity, right? You're not supposed to just go around and go, oh, well, if, it, if the church is supposed to be generous, I guess I just won't work and I'll just ask them for money and it'd be great. I just can go do whatever I want. And his point here is don't worry about why they're not working. It's not important. The fact is you should be working. You should be making your own money so that you don't have to 
rely on other people's generosity. So, 2 Thessalonians really is just an extension of 1 Thessalonians in many ways. It's written several months later, but it's the same churches, it's it's a lot of the same issues, and it's just kind of the next level, right? So, it kind of puts us in that context of Paul's talking to them, a couple months goes by, he gets another report that they're not really listening that well, and so he writes a second letter to address these issues again. Any questions? Okay. First Timothy. As we turn in our Bibles and we get to First Timothy, it is the first letter that we're now reading that is less, that is not as, what am I trying to say? Is not written so much for a specific church, but is written to a specific person. Now, put a little star next to that because this one is written a little bit to the church in Ephesus as well, but the point was, I'm going to send this to Timothy, he's going to read it, and he's going to read it out loud, and so it's going to be a lot of instruction for Timothy, but I also want the church in Ephesus to overhear my instructions to Timothy so that it's kind of like, a, you know, hey, deal with those guys who aren't teaching well, <laughs> and they're going, wait, he's talking about me, like it's supposed to be this kind of overheard letter um, to the church in Ephesus. But this is the beginning of Paul's pastoral letters. You know, he's writing these as a pastor to someone or writing them to those who are pastors in the church. Um, And this letter is specifically an indictment against some false teachers, both their character and their teachings, and then with some instructions on some community matters that these teachers have brought to crisis. Um, It's primarily encouragement, but it's also primarily It's trying to strengthen Timothy's hand as he's dealing with these false teachers. Um, So Paul is writing this to his longtime younger colleague in Timothy. Timothy is the pastor at Ephesus at this point. He's writing this towards the end of his life in AD 62 and 63. Most likely he's in Rome still. He's in prison. He's just awaiting kind of his his trial, his sentencing. Um, So he's writing this to Timothy. Now, Timothy, we know a little bit about him. He was of mixed marriage, so his mother was Jewish, his father was Gentile. He's from Lystra in Galatia, and he's most likely converted when he's younger as Paul's ministering um, in Galatia, and he decides to follow Paul on many of his missionary journeys. Again, we read through Acts. We see Timothy all over. We just talked about Timothy. He was the one who went back to Thessalonica. He's been sent to different churches with letters, with words of encouragement, to get reports, to get financial gifts. So in many ways, Timothy has become kind of his little apprentice, has become his right-hand man, his second-in-command in many ways. Um, Paul, in many ways, has been like a father to him, and Timothy like a son. So this is very much, you know, this is, this is Papa Paul writing to, <laughs> to, to son Timothy, saying, hey, I hear that things are going really hard let me, let me give you some words of encouragement. Let me see if I can help you in many ways. Um, so Paul is specifically writing to Timothy in this, um, in this letter because he's left him in charge as the pastor in Ephesus, and it's just a really difficult situation. He has a lot of leaders, a lot of the elders in the church here in Ephesus who are leading people astray, who are, are um, teaching a lot of false doctrine, but even more than that, they're not even leading by their character. A lot of the way they're living is not gospel-centered, is not um, as they should. So he's writing this to, to Timothy to encourage him, but also, as I said, he's, he, Timothy's going to read this out loud to the church. It's supposed to strengthen his hand, right? So as Timothy's saying, you shouldn't teach that, you shouldn't do that, and they're going, whatever, Timothy, you're young, and who cares what you have to say? Here comes Paul, right? This is the guy who planted the church. This is, this is Paul. He is the church planner of this time. And Paul says, hey, stop teaching these things and stop doing these things. And they go, oh, okay, Paul said it. We should listen. And so it's really trying to strengthen Timothy's hand here as he's addressing these false teachers. But on the flip side, he's also trying to address the qualities of church leaders. So we know when we say, well, what are, what are elders in the church supposed to look like? We always go to 1 Timothy because he writes out this list of qualifications for deacons, for elders, for pastors, for what those in church leadership should look like. 
But again, when we, we I think we have the tendency, we know, well, the, the Bible is a big thematic, you know, kind of concordance where we just, I need to learn about prayer today. Where's the passage on prayer? We forget that these are all letters in which Paul's addressing issues and he happens to talk about prayer. Well, here he's addressing an issue about poor leadership, and that's why we get these great passages about what does good leadership in the church look like. It wasn't just because Paul was writing a doctrinal book to Timothy and was like, I'm going to address what elders should look like today. He was addressing these false teachers who weren't living as they should and said, hey, if you're a lover of money, that's going to disqualify you from church leadership. And, he, and he, as, we're, as Timothy's reading this, one of the elders who is just stealing from the church coffer is saying, hmm, I think he's talking to me there. I think that might be an issue for me. So we read it on this side and we say, wow, what great teaching, what great reminders. He's really addressing specific issues here. So he's addressing not only their teaching, but he's addressing the qualities of leaders, giving advice on personal conduct, um, and again, strengthening Timothy's hand to deal with these elders. So, in many ways, if you remember back to the letter of Galatians, where you start reading Galatians and you're going, whoa, where is, where is the flowy, I am so thankful to God and I pray for you every day kind of intro, it just immediately says, I can't believe you've given up on the gospel and are doing this, that, or the other. He comes out kind of red hot. This is very similar. As you read it, there's a little bit of an introduction, but he's immediately saying, hey, I hear there's some issues going on, let me get right down to business. So this letter is very much all business. Um, Paul has very specific things he needs to address here. Again, when it comes to themes, um, it starts with the truth of the gospel is God's mercy shown toward all people. Some of these teachers were, again, going back to Jewish ways. We're saying you have to be circumcised, you have to go through food laws. So, no, this is God's mercy to all people, even Gentiles. Um, again, he addresses character qualifications. He addresses the speculative teachings, um, the issue of asceticism, which is um, caring about things of this world. It's a simple way to define that. Um, love of controversy, love of money disqualifies one from church leadership. You find out, especially as you read 2 Timothy, a lot of these false teachers, they just loved controversy. Again, don't raise your hand, but like, we know people like that, right, who just, they just love stirring up controversy. It kind of is like what gets them up in the morning is what can I, what controversial thing can I post on social media today, or what kind of thing can I say in a group of my friends in order to stir up an argument because I just really like arguing. I mean, this is what these teachers were, and Paul is trying to say, this is not good for church leadership, right? Leaders shouldn't just be stirring up controversy all the time. And then finally is this call for Timothy to hold fast to the gospel and that he should model genuine Christian character. One, because it's good, but two, because no one else is doing it in the church in Ephesus right now. So he's saying, you know, stand true in the, in the gospel, don't give in to their false teaching, but also stand true in what it means to live as a Christian. Don't give in to the ways that they're living. Don't feel like they're, oh, they're, they're, they're my leaders, so I should give in to that. He's saying, no, you know what's good and right, so live that way. So again, when it comes to first to helps, I think this is really important. I'll, I'll just throw this first one up. These false teachers were likely elders in the church who were using the homes of younger widows for their novelties. What that means is for their teaching. That's really important because 1 Timothy is one of the most misunderstood letters, I think, because we go, what does it say about women in church leadership? And you read stuff like, I, the women should not teach at all. And you read all this stuff and we start to say, well, there it is. It's in black and white. And we start throwing these big black and white kind of commands out there instead of forgetting again the context of what's going on in this letter. Paul's writing to a specific church that's dealing with a specific problem. Well, here's your specific problem. These false teachers who are elders in the church are using these homes of younger widows in order to teach. So what's happening is these young widows who in that time, women would not have received any type of teaching. So they have no background in Jewish, um, in Jewish understanding or even at that point because they're newer believers of what the gospel is. And here they're hearing these elders talk about all these false things and Paul's saying, you shouldn't be teaching because you don't actually understand what the true gospel is. So he's kind of telling these women who are hosting these false teachers that you definitely shouldn't be in any situation teaching. And that's why he's also encouraging them to care for older widows, for the younger widows to marry, and for them not to teach. 
is because this is what's going on. So these, these commands, although some of them are, are still useful, for, you know, we should care for older widows, um, some of these were very contextual and very specific to what's going on. They weren't these black and white things that we need to say, well, it says this and therefore it translates perfectly. I don't have the time or brain capacity to go into big exposition on then what does the Bible say on these things, but you'll have to trust me that we need to take the whole of God's word in order to understand the whole of these issues when it comes to the women's uh, complementary role in the church, when it comes to what do widows do, who they're older or younger, do they marry, do they remain single, what is this? And Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians, um, uh, specifically these issues as well. So, um, but this is why we get a lot of what's coming out in this letter. This is why he's writing to Timothy and not, this isn't, this isn't the letter of Second Ephesians because he can't write to the elders in, in Ephesus because they're the ones causing all the problems. This is why he's writing about proper qualifications that, they, that these elders should be replaced with because they're the ones that are causing the issues. And then finally, this is why there's little gospel content and more practical instruction in this letter. It's because like the gospel is just going out the window for these teachers, and he's saying, we got to deal with these people. we got to deal with these teachers. I don't have time in this letter to address all the specifics about the gospel. We really need to make sure we take care of the issue at hand. And then the other one that I wanted to mention briefly is that this teaching was a mix of both Jewish and Greek, and as such, it focuses on special revelation, so this idea... Um, one of the early heresies is this idea called Gnosticism. You don't need to memorize that, but it was this idea that you had to have special spiritual knowledge in order to be a good religious person. I mean, they, they brought it into Christianity, and to be a good disciple, you just needed to have special wisdom. So these false teachers would come and say, well, I've been given this special wisdom from God, so you should listen to me. And what Paul is trying to constantly show in his letters is that the word of God is, is, the, is enough. The word of God is that, that revelation, right? So when we get to um, 2 Timothy 3, we know that that's one of our favorite passages to go to when it talks about the sufficiency of Scripture. You don't need to have special wisdom other than the Spirit's guidance and God's word before you. Um, again, they were interested in myths and endless genealogies. There's some of the Jewish stuff. Um, and they just loved controversy and greed. So they're kind of coming in. They want to make money. They're trying to say, hey, we have these, this special revelation. Let's argue about nonsensical things that don't really matter. And as we do that, you can pay us, and that'll make us happy, and you'll get this special wisdom that we have. And so it's just, again, it's, it's a mess, and this is happening in a church. So Paul, obviously, he doesn't have time for flowery introductions. There's a real serious issue that he needs to address in this letter. So really, when you're reading 1 Timothy, put yourself in Timothy's shoes. You're a pastor of a church where your elders have just completely abandoned the gospel. They are leading young widows who don't have husbands who can teach them and lead them in gospel truth. They're, they're leading them astray. They're ignoring the care of older widows who don't have anybody to support them in that context at that time. And, and, and so you're this pastor. You're young. People aren't really listening to you that well. And as such, you're getting this letter, and it's, just, it's full of just encouragement, and okay, I can do this, and I'm, now my hand is strengthened, and I can go and address these issues. Um, so really, put yourself in Timothy's shoes, and you'll feel more of the impact of this letter. Any questions on First Timothy? We have one minute, but because Second Timothy is an extension of First Timothy, we're going to go through it. Um, I hope I hope you feel like I can give it justice, but again, it's, it's about a year or two later. Paul is just, he's, he knows he's about to die, right? He, he knows his life is going to end soon. So he's writing this final appeal to Timothy really to remain loyal to Christ, right? This is like his last will and testament. He's just writing to his, 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 his young colleague, his apprentice, and just saying, stand firm in the gospel. I won't be here to encourage you for much longer, so stand firm in the gospel, Stand firm to me and to what I've taught you. Um, and then he goes, one more final assault against these false teachers. Um, 
He's writing it to Timothy. He's in prison in Rome. This is around AD 64, probably one of the last letters. It, it is probably the last preserved letter of Paul that we have. Um, and really, he's just writing to him to say, I know I'm about to die. I really want you to come be by my side. I want you to go get Mark and get some of my other belongings, and I want you to bring them to me. That would be a great comfort to me. But really, that's like the end of his letter. That's why he's writing. But this is so Pauline, right? Is That's why he's writing the letter, but he spends the rest of the letter talking about false teachers, about the gospel, about the joy that we have in the gospel, about enduring suffering. And But he's really writing because he he's just really wants... Uh, uh, Mark and Timothy to be with him. But while he's doing things, he's going, by the way, here's all this exhortation I want to give you as well. So when it comes to themes, again, he, this is like a call to stand firm. Stand firm in suffering, stand firm in opposition, stand firm in false teaching. So the saving work of Christ to destroy death and brought life through the gospel, that's one of his themes. Is, is, he is enough. He is more than enough. He is sufficient. Again, this loyalty to Christ by perseverance and suffering, this loyalty to Paul um, by recalling their longtime friendship, this loyalty to the gospel by being faithful in proclaiming and teaching the word. And then he attacks again these false teachers and addresses the salvation that those who are in Christ do have. The structure really quickly oops, is three parts. It's three appeals, and they have this ABA structure. So the first is, be loyal, don't defect, be loyal. This next one is, you're going to uh, face opposition, so be loyal because there's opposition. And then finally, see how I've been loyal. Let me appeal to you to be similarly loyal because I've been loyal. So it's kind of, that's his, his, his appeals here are, here's what I'm asking you to do because of this, so I'm asking you to do it, right? He kind of is repeating himself there. So, Two helps, I know there's a bunch of sub-points there, but two helps when you're reading Second Timothy, sorry if it's me, um, is unlike some of these other letters where he's writing from prison, it is clear here that he does not expect to be free from his chains, right? He knows that death is coming, but what's amazing about this letter is that there's this note of triumph, there's this note of peace and joy, even though he's about to face death, even though he's about to be killed for his faith. Um, he, he's, again, back to the, the themes there, right? That the saving work of Christ who has destroyed death and brought life, that's his hope, even as he's about to die. And then similarly, we, we learn further about the false teachers. Um, you'll notice in your notes the first sub-point, I made a typo. It says, they life. I changed it for this. It says, they like. So these false teachers, they like to quarrel. They've wandered away from the truth, arguing that the resurrection's already taken place. Um, They've had noteworthy success against what Paul calls gullible women. Again, this is these young widows. And then finally, their lifestyle does not conform to the gospel, which is why he commands them to have these specific qualifications. So, again, to understand these letters, put yourself in Timothy's shoes. Your mentor is dying. You're having a tough go at it as a pastor in this church. And he's just encouraging you, you know. Stand firm in the gospel. You're going to experience suffering. You're going to ex experience opposition and false teaching. But remain loyal. Remember the gospel you have um, and stand firm in that. Any questions, comments? Okay. I know I firehosed you. I was away for the beginning of this week, so a lot of these notes were from last week. So I am like quickly ran through these ones. Um, but we're going to jump in and we're going to start to see more of the pastoral letters. We're going to see some of these other letters that aren't necessarily from Paul, which are really interesting. I just got back from the Gospel Coalition National Conference where they did it on the book of Hebrews. So when we get to Hebrews, there's no chance that I'm going to get through it well because I'm just going to want to preach everything I just heard this past week. So get ready for that. I'm going to fire hose you like crazy because the book of Hebrews is amazing. Um, but I'm excited. We're, we're plugging away here. Um, you have next week off from me. Um, we have... Um, missionaries coming to preach and will be presenting during this time. So I have the week off. You have the week off from having to listen to me. Go listen to him as he comes and teaches you. And I'll see you guys in two weeks as we wrap up through the end of the New Testament in the coming month. Let me say a prayer and we'll be dismissed. God, thank you again for your word. Thank you again that we can know it, that we can understand it, but even more importantly that it applies to us still today, that it has 
transformative power and effect in our lives. Um, May we just daily look to you. May we daily look to the leading of your spirit. Um, And may we just rejoice in the gospel truths and the hope that we do have in you and your resurrection. Thank you, Lord, that you are good, that you are in control of all things. Um, We just thank you for the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, guys.